webinar now. Just to give folks a minute to come in. Okay. <laughs> you don't hear anything on my background? Is that okay? Yep, you're good. Okay. I, I do hear my wife uh, listening to the news. <laughs> <laughs> if we hear screams, we know what happened. Well, we don't know what happened, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm more nervous about my dogs. Oh. If, if, if Cookie, the dog of the neighbor, uh, ex starts exploring my front yard, we, we will know. You'll know. <laughs> yeah. Maria, let me know when you'd like me to start. Yeah, it looks like folks are still coming in, but it's 8.30, so if you are ready, Victoria, oh, yeah. you can go ahead. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 oh. Health and Social Justice Conference. My name is Victoria Rivkina, and I am the Program Manager of the Master of Public Health Program at DePaul University. For those of you who have been joining us for several years, you'll know that this is our 13th annual conference. Since 2008, we've had more than 3,500 participants. This conference is co-hosted by DePaul's Master of Public Health Program and the Center for Community Health Equity, which is a joint center between DePaul and Rush University. We also have additional sponsorship by DePaul's Department of Health Sciences. This year, we're hosting our first virtual conference. So in the time of COVID, we have been able to pivot. We have over 400 folks registered and you'll be able to view over 50 presentations today. Our conference is broken up into a keynote speaker in the morning, some breakout sessions, and then a keynote speaker in the afternoon. Our breakout sessions are divided into five tracks. There's one Zoom meeting link and one moderator per track. You'll be able to go back and forth between tracks depending on which presentation you'd like to see during any given time. You can also view poster presentations at your convenience throughout the day, which are posted to an HESJ branded YouTube channel. All participants and presenters got links to that YouTube channel yesterday. In terms of our Zoom manners, please, when you are joining meetings, have your microphone off. And if you feel comfortable, you can leave your camera on. Moderators will let everyone in and they'll explain the format for each session. And then I really don't want to say this, but I think I have to. Anyone who behaves inappropriately to Zoom um, will be removed. Also, please note that all sessions are being recorded. The other thing I'd like to say is that we have a very full conference. So the Zoom information for all of our breakout sessions was not made public. Um, please keep those handouts that I sent to you with all the Zoom login information handy so you can refer to them throughout the day and enter whichever Zoom meeting room you'd like to be in. And then one other thing, this is our first virtual conference, so please be patient and kind if we do have any technical issues throughout the day. Before I turn it over, I would like to thank some very important people who made this conference possible. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Dr. Maria Ferreira. She's an associate professor with DePaul University's Department of Social Work. She's the co-director of the Center for Community Health Equity, and she's also a co-chair um, for, oops, sorry about that, for the Coalition for Immigrant Mental Health. I would also like to thank our planning committee, which includes John Mazio, 
Emily Tamlin, Priya Waite, and Erin Augustine. I'd like to thank our abstract reviewers who looked at all the abstracts that were submitted. I'd like to thank our conference moderators who have a very long and busy day ahead of them. And then finally, I would really like to thank all the presenters who are making this conference possible and to both of our keynote speakers, Adam Alonzo and Kim Wasserman. I'm now going to turn it over to the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences at DePaul, Guillermo Vasquez de Velasco. Thank you, Victoria. And, and thank you so much to everyone that has collaborated to make this event possible. I'm very aware that it takes a lot more than someone waving a magic wand to make you all appear in my screen. Uh, greetings and, and thank you uh, for joining us uh, here today in, in Zoom land. Uh, welcome to this amazing event that brings us together to share from a pool of knowledge that is so critical in today's world. As Victoria mentioned, every year, uh, the Masters of Public Health Program and the Center for Community uh, Health Equity team up, collaborate to host the Health Equity and Social Justice Conference. For the last 13 consecutive years, they have done that, serving Chicago's public health professions, which is uh, an extraordinary achievement on itself. Thank you so much. As you attend today's keynotes and the many sessions of the day, I would like to invite you to keep a very important word in mind. And that word is collaboration. We live in the world that is not divided into our academic silos. We may be divided in many other word, ways, but uh, the problems we're facing out there are complex some may say even complicated and call for multidisciplinary collaboration to be addressed. Our faculty and staff in our Masters of Public Health program and our Center for Community Health and Equity have bridged across those silos many times, every day, not only to contribute in projects, but to truly collaborate. And I always make a distinction between contribute and collaborate because to contribute is more like preparing a salad. We can all work independently, then bring things together and we still can see all the bits and pieces, all the ingredients inside the salad. Collaboration is more challenging. It is more like cooking chicken mole where you don't see the ingredients anymore but something amazing emerged from that combination. Furthermore, and beyond internal collaborations, uh, our program and our center uh, have a long-term partnership with Rush, a partnership for which we're very thankful. Also in terms of uh, outreach, uh, they collaborate with many of you out there uh, here today in this forum, uh, making me very proud and very hopeful about a brighter future. As you all know, DePaul University, it is a place of uh, learning. It is also a place of diversity. It is a place of empathy and uh, it is a place of collaboration. I look forward to celebrating your many collective achievements as we continue to collaborate in the attainment of health equity and social justice. And now it is my pleasure and an honor to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Chief Executive Officer of BUILD, Adam Alonso. Adam brings over 25 years of nonprofit and youth development experience, having served as the director of the State of Illinois Welcoming Center for Immigrants and Refugees, also the director of community engagement for the United Way of Metropolitan Chicago. He has also served 
as the director of uh, youth services at uh, Casa Central and Illinois Action for Children. And uh, he has been the founding executive director of Corazon Community Services, a youth-oriented nonprofit agency in Cicero. Since his arrival at BUILD only five years ago, BUILD has experienced significant growth in programs, its community leadership role, and overall impact. His many new initiatives include the Block 51 Arts Academy and the Building Girls to Women program. He has also dramatically expanded behavioral and mental health services and comprehensive community services for victims of violence. He has also uh, transformed uh, the budget of BUILD, uh, uh, making it three times bigger, uh, positioning the agency for long-term sustainability, and has launched a capital campaign to quadruple the physical space of the organization. Truly amazing impact. Adam holds a BA in Latin American Studies from the University of Chicago, a Master's of Social Work from Loyola University, also here in Chicago, and a Certificate in Nonprofit Management from the University of Notre Dame. Please join me in welcoming Adam Alonso. Uh, thank you, Dr. Velasco. It's a, an honor to be here with everyone this morning. Uh, streaming live from Build. Uh, you might see people going back and forth by my door. Uh, so uh, that hope that won't be too distracting. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, as a youth service organization, what we've uh, been experiencing when we think about health equity and social justice. Um, I would argue that many of, the, of us in the nonprofit world are really in many ways at the epicenter of everything that's happening. And uh, I think there are a lot of lessons that we've all learned, right? There's no playbook for any of this. We are literally kind of learning on the fly. So I'm gonna go ahead and present some slides. Bear with me. I just learned how to do the show presenter view so I can see notes. So I'm all excited to use that uh, this morning. Um, so, I, how are we doing all this, right? How are we supporting our young people in the challenges of today? Um, and, you know, I, I kind of end with this morning with sort of an aha moment, uh, which may not be too much of an aha moment for many, um, but it has been for me. So Simply Build is a 51 year old organization. Um, in 1969, we were the first street gang intervention program here in the city of Chicago. And the founders really knew it was important to think about how to engage young people who are actually in gangs. And so um, they saw the value in reaching out and, and connecting with them. So not just ignoring them as you walk by in the corner, but really getting out there. What's happening? Why are you on the corner? What can we do? Um, you know, these are some opportunities for you and we care about about you. So the intervention work um, is deeply embedded into the work of BUILD and streams through all of our work that we've, we've been doing for over 50 years. So quite simply, it really is about helping to transform young people's lives. Um, how do youth come to BUILD? Well, let me pause first for a moment and say that uh, currently, actually, we are anchored in the Austin community. Uh, we've been here for about nine years. We're in the corner of Harrison and Laramie. Uh, but for 43 years of Bill's existence, we were in a two-story walk-up on Milwaukee Avenue. And so for those of you who know Bill, know Bill from kind of the small office space uh, that existed in that part of town. And uh, we serve across uh, the city of Chicago as far south as Fuller Park and Bronzeville, um, all the way to our Belmont Cragen, Hermosa, Humble Park, um, and here in Austin and East Garfield Park as well. So how do young people come to us? Uh, schools, social workers, referrals, young people who vote with their feet, right? They tell their friends, they come on over to build. We have some really cool things that are happening. Uh, we work closely with the police department, juvenile justice, 
um, and reentry, getting uh, people back into community and helping them to find their right next space as they continue on. Uh, we think about our services, the purple sort of three core programs that we consider our core, our intervention work, which I spoke to a little bit, uh, prevention and education, those make up the core of the things that we offer our young people. And then uh, wrapped around those core services are clinical and community wellness, and then all the enrichment opportunities that we would provide for young people. Um, Build serves uh, as young as six years old, so like first grade, all the way through mid-20s, 26, 27 years of age. So uh, mentioned our intervention team and many of the folks who uh, actually work for the intervention team were former gang members. They were formerly incarcerated, uh, have been down a path that they've learned, you know, that this is not the, the best thing for them. And they have a mission that I always say is actually bigger than Build's mission. It really is to, to help young people find a new way of living life and to prevent them from entering into the system, making poor choices. And so we have a team of about 12 uh, men and women who are out on the streets, they're in the schools, uh, representing young people in court. Um, and their work is really about getting young people out of gangs, back into school, uh, and looking for a job if that's where uh, that young person is, is looking to go. Um, there are gang detachments that they do, uh, that, and the gang detachment process can, is basically a negotiation process um, and our uh, guys are really skilled at working with the community um, and uh, the leadership of, of gangs and working to get young people out. Probably do about 35 of those a year. Um, our prevention work is really centered around after school programming, right? How do you prevent young people from getting into the system and the uh, trouble, what are the sorts of cool things you can engage them with? So we help them academically, uh, enrichment, life skills programs, field trips, kind of all the fun things you would want to do after school. Uh, we support them during breaks uh, and in the summer as well. And uh, we do have a teen center uh, that's open here on site and then serve many of our prevention programs off site in partner schools. Our education work is about getting young people uh, connected to college. How do we have our first generation students of color navigate that system, right? From college uh, application process to the FAFSA application process, um, the college exploration, we do college trips. Um, we help them prepare for SAT, ACT. Um, and really we work with the families as well, right? For many of these young people, it's the first time that they are leaving to school. Uh, and for those that actually leave out of state, um, we have someone who helps to support them very specifically, uh, working with them to make sure as they're having that first transition uh, can be rough, right? For that first quarter, first semester at school, uh, things are very different. You're not in your neighborhood. You don't have sort of the, um, the safety net that you're used to back home. Uh, but the uh, uh, Kappa person that we have, the College and Persistence Access um, uh, team member actually works with them, meets with them pretty week, uh, weekly, and we work with the family, right? Because sometimes there are situations at the home where that might bring a young person back. So we try to work with the family as well as the young person so that we can have these uh, young people persist through school. Um, enrichment programs, I think, are just, uh, I'd probably enjoy thinking about them <clears throat> as much as uh, the young people who actually do them. There are so many opportunities um, that we provide for young people to try new things, right? We, on our campus here, have a small farm, um, although we're not allowed to call it a small farm because then zoning would have to step in and we'd have to change that. So it's a community teaching garden. Uh, which it does at it absolutely. We have young people who plant during um, the spring season. And then the great piece about that is that the community comes to harvest. So we have our seniors who live across the street. Uh, we'll interact with our young people who are there uh, tending to the garden. Uh, they get to come and pick fresh produce. And uh, it's really this cool neighborhood space that we've created outdoors. Um, we have podcasting. Uh, if you get a chance to go to our website, www.buildchicago.org, and you can see there's a click, a clickable uh, icon for Build Radio. 
Um, and there you'll see our podcast shows. And those podcast shows are really cool. They're put together by young people. Uh, and it's everything from interviews with sports figures to elected officials. Um, it's um, music that they've created. It's uh, all sorts of spoken word pieces and they stitch it together in, a, in an hour format. Um, I'm always a big fan of the entire podcast um, work, but I will say that episode seven, if you get a chance to listen to it, is my favorite. Um, and that is an interview between um, Commander Cato and one of the young people that he encountered here who was a build participant and what transpired when they got together to meet again four years later. So it's a story of, I think, of inspiration and of hope and of certainly, of course, of people being able to change. Um, we have arts, as I mentioned, our arts programs uh, go across the city and all on all the areas where we're at. And, you know, it's not that we want to turn out or churn out artists per se, but it's really art for art's sake, right? Uh, for some people, this is the first time getting a brush in hand on canvas, using oils, using acrylics. Uh, but we also have found that really it's been highly therapeutic and that the best way we found for some individuals has been to put that brush in their hand, let them start to release some of the stress and the pressure and actually use it as a tool for talking. So um, we've discovered that and actually we have two art therapists on staff with us today. Music, sports, kind of all the fun things that you would think that's what our enrichment work really is about. And lastly, our clinical and community wellness. This is really centered around um, providing that support for our young people. We know that uh, just growing up in these communities is tough, right? Uh, they're challenged economically, there's violence. You can kind of think of all the things that the community may be lacking or the home for that matter. Um, and so we have um, beefed up our clinical work. We have 25 therapists on the staff now. Um, that's as, actually as of about two years ago. Um, and the cool part about the way that we provide clinical services here um, on site at Build. So Build, where we're at, used to be Shore Bank. So it's an old bank building, uh, which we've really uh, retrofitted. We have all this open space that we use for programs and we've created a wellness room. Um, and so young people get to come to the wellness room, have their session, walk right back out, go to the teen center, or they might go to a different session that's happening within the building. Um, and all of us in administration are actually in the building too. So after three o'clock, I will tell you, it gets a little noisy in here. Um, but the cool part about it is that young people don't feel like it's weird, right? Like, oh, I'm going to see a therapist and you sit in a quiet waiting room. And let me be clear, nothing wrong with any of that. Those are appropriate spaces. But I think for young people here, it feels as normal as doing art, as normal as going outside and shooting hoops, right? I come in, I see my therapist and I head right back out. And trying to normalize that for our young people, people has really been a goal of ours because we want them to know and claim for themselves when it is that they need help and who they can go to uh, for that help. So super excited about our, our, ther our therapist team that's here. Um, about a year ago, we've actually undertaken some new work. Uh, it's our crisis intervention team. Sadly, they're the team that responds when there's been a homicide. Um, and so you may have heard about this. It's uh, definitely there are more organizations and groups doing it across the city, right, as, as the city has a need for it. Um, but our crisis team will walk a family through from being at the hospital or identifying their loved one at a morgue, um, working on burial arrangements, and oftentimes uh, there may be even a relocation need. And so our crisis intervention team walks with that family from start to finish all the way through, tying them back in for uh, therapy when they're ready for it. So that's the work of BUILD, right? And uh, we've been in the midst of Kind of the work that we've been doing we've been growing um, and we really have been about i always say we're not a one-stop shop but the reality is is that in some ways we have to be right for our young people because traveling even within a neighborhood is not always safe um, so if we can if they can get their after school programming they can see a therapist here they can do basketball and sports you know we're going to provide that as an opportunity for them so that's kind of where we are as an organization and, and really sort of a hub here in the Austin neighborhood and in particular in the South Austin neighborhood. 
Um, as we know, right, March hit and life changed dramatically for everyone. Um, we had the pandemic that hit. And um, again, as I said earlier, like there was no playbook for any of this. And I will say we all kind of retreated back to our homes, the shelter in place. And it really felt like this was a two week stint, right? That's what we said, like we're in a shelter in place for two weeks. Um, the first thing we knew to do was to make sure that we were in communication with all of our young people. So it was phone calls, it was texts, it was FaceTime, you know, checking in, how are you doing? Are you guys okay? Stay safe, um, stay inside. Um, do, you need a, do you need masks? Do you have them? Uh, we also learned that a lot of our young people, the home wasn't safe. And so they were outside and they were not um, uh, properly wearing PPE, they didn't have it to wear. Um, and so that was a big concern for us because my team was entirely sheltered in place. Um, I wanted to make sure that the team stayed healthy. Um, so we came up with some ideas to come up with activity and arts and care kits that we would have delivered to families. And um, it was our way of staying connected with some things for them to, to do. Uh, activities that a family could do together, whether it be puzzles or board games. Um, and then real quickly, we had to figure out what is this whole virtual life, right? Zoom, as we know it today, is such an important part of everything that we do. This conference, 100% on Zoom. Um, so we quickly learned uh, what that meant for us in, as an organization to have that available for staff. Um, how do you social media, Insta hubs and Instagram and Facebook, Twitter, kind of all the places that we would find our young people and how do we engage them through activity? Um, so we did that. We, we started putting our content out online, checking in with young people. Hey, we'll see you on the Zoom call. Um, and thus started sort of our connection. We knew that uh, our young people in our communities were really gonna be hit hardest, right? The pandemic was gonna shine the light on poverty and we saw it and it continues to play out in that way. Um, what we did internally for our staff, um, the leadership team was meeting every day. And uh, I tell you, I was, I think Zoom was a bit novel to us all at the time. So I think there was a level of, hey, it's Zoom and it was exciting at first. Um, and then I think over time, that's kind of, the luster has definitely worn off, huh? Um, but, you know, think about what was happening during that time, right? The mayor was speaking, so you had to watch to see what the mayor said, right? Then the governor came out, you had to watch to see what the governor was saying. Then the president came out, choose to watch or not what he said. The reality was there was information that was coming at us almost hour to hour, and it changed every time, right? So how do you think about leading your teams and telling them so they know how to work with young people, right? So they know what to do differently or what, what will change. Um, we had lots of conversations around programming. What do we do? Are we living in this virtual world forever? None of us are virtual content creators. What do we do? Do we need like the little, the little lights so it'll be properly lit? You know, I've never had to walk someone through in a video recorded step-by-step -step how to create, you know, an art piece. Um, it was all very challenging for everyone. And we knew also that a weekly Zoom call was important because there were about 85 of us as a team. We were completely sheltered in place and the information was ever changing. And so what were we as an organization doing? So uh, those weekly Zoom calls with 85 people, we did it and we gave updates. And we also were very clear that we're learning through this to be patient and that we're doing our best to figure it out. Then the murder of George Floyd, right? Um, the nation watched in horror as uh, Mr. Floyd lost his life at the hands of police. And it was powerful to see the reaction across the country and certainly here in the city. And I remember that Sunday as we watched everything unfold on TV, um, just pure shock and outrage and all the emotions people were feeling um, I quickly called up the leadership team because I felt like we, we couldn't wait till Friday, right, to have this conversation with staff. So on the Monday following, we got everyone on a Zoom call. Just as a point of check-in, um, it, was, it was highly emotional for all of us, but I'll tell you that Zoom call was the most powerful, raw, um, 
the level of emotion, I, I it just felt like they were reaching through the screen and grabbing, and right because a lot of our people live in these communities um, where the looting was happening. Our black and brown themselves who've experienced many of the same things that uh, people of color have experienced across this this country, and so. We, um, one of our trained restorative justice circle keepers, we asked her to lead that circle for that day, that morning. Um, and so doing a, a, a peace circle with 85 people on a Zoom call, I wasn't sure how it would go, but she did an amazing job facilitating. And let me say this, that, you know, to hear the raw emotions of people, the tears, the frustration, the anger, um, uh, you know, I have this rule that you just don't cry at work, cry for your family, cry for your loved ones, but don't cry at work. Um, and I, I cried. I mean, the intensity of the emotion and what was being poured out in that moment was so palpable. And, you know, Build has been about Black Lives Matters since 1969. We've been about black and brown. We've been about the ones that everyone says, no one's, those kids are never gonna make it. They'll never amount to anything. This was our space. We have been about doing the work for these communities for the longest time. But I'll tell you the power of that call and what people, our teams reported was, thank you for giving us the space to say all of that emotion. So that quickly translated to, we needed to host a series of calls with our young people, right? What were they feeling, right? People were out protesting, they were out there, they were mad, they were frustrated. And so our team quickly mobilized and uh, got young people in a ser series of Zoom calls to go through a very similar sort of uh, peace circle process to process what was going on. Um, so when you think about uh, all that was happening, right? You're struggling through understanding what the pandemic is. Um, the murder of George Floyd, and then all of the subsequent before and after um, people of color who have died, right? It was just enough is enough. So add to that the uptick in violence in the neighborhood. So uh, it, it's almost started to feel like, what else, right? We're already managing through um, two really incredibly difficult things. And there's no end in sight for the pandemic at that point, right? And when you think about racism, how, it's not like you just click a switch and great, people aren't racist anymore, right? You, how do you uproot racism in systems that are meant to oppress, right? This was difficult work. People wanted to be out there. People wanted to be protesting, our staff, our kids, our young people, right? There's a push and a pull to be out there in solidarity and responding but the pandemic still existed, right? That didn't change. And, you know, the fear of get our team getting sick, potentially dying, potentially infecting their family members, all of these things weighed heavy um, on us all, but yet we knew that it was important to have a voice in that space. And so uh, our many of our team members went out and marched um, and you know, I, this was much bigger than than anything that I could say or do. And we were in support. Hey, you know, we understand. Wear your mask. Uh, I, you can't really socially distance too much in a march, uh, but we want you to be safe. And so we supported marches. We ourselves were in a series of marches over the summer uh, to support that violence. Um, and I'll speak specifically here in, in Austin. Uh, when I started in 2015, uh, violence was on the rise. And by 2016, Austin was the number one most violent neighborhood in the city of Chicago. It was sad. Um, and this is why we, we opened up a teen center. Uh, this is why we kind of reconverted our space inside Bill to say, we need to be a safe haven. We're across the street from Michelle Clark High School, down the street from George Leland Elementary down to the uh, north of us, we have Christ the King uh, High School. We're in a spot where there are hundreds and hundreds of kids every single day and Bill needs to open its doors. And so we did. Um, and the violence at that point was very difficult in 2016. Our commander of the 15th district, then uh, Commander Cato, uh, brought us together, the nonprofits, worked hard to form partnerships to 
respond to acts of potential retaliation. And I will say that um, we were able to bring the violence as we work together down over uh, year over year. But then all this happens, there's a huge spike. People are going stir crazy, locked inside their homes, having to wear a mask. The, the relationships between police and community eroded, right? Think of all the things that were going on and it just really began to feel like absolute mayhem. Um, in our Memorial Day, right? It was the deadliest in five years. We had 49 shootings, 10 fatalities. Um, one of our team members here lost their nephew to gun violence. Um, several youth this summer, several, several of our youth died because they were at a family gathering, doing what people do, right? As family, loving, being there, supporting. And the fact that they couldn't even be there to enjoy <clears throat> what was supposed to be um, something positive, they were doing the right thing, someone drove up and shot and killed. These are the stories as we heard, right? When you turn on the TV after a weekend, you know, and you hear it's just the numbers, who's been shot, how many people were killed, what's happening. Um, I'll just tell you, it, it was, there's almost a point of, of, of helplessness that you feel when you've got the pandemic, you've got the, the social unrest, you've got now this uptick in violence. And, you know, I felt like once upon a time, we understood how and why, and there were things that we put in place to really try to help work as a community to bring this down, but it just felt like all those things were off the table. Um, and when you talk about the level of uncertainty and what was happening, it was absolutely insane. Um, so in response to this, um, we did have a plan for in-person programming. Uh, we were gonna serve kids in the summer camp, right? As the city began to open up slowly, um, we knew that our kids needed to have a safe place to be this summer. Um, our intervention team worked around the clock to help interrupt violence. Um, we had community walks and I'll tell you, it was just kind of one of those things like, what, why are we not talking to each other in the neighborhood, right? Why are we just not getting kind of back to basics, if you will? So um, the team, we got together, we invited uh, our other nonprofit partners and other departments to join us. And um, every day there was a walk in Austin and in Humboldt Park, and it was just talking to people. Not that we were trying to sign people up or sell things or, hey, join this program. It really was, how are you today, right? What? you know, and just kind of relating as people. And when you think about um, sometimes in our neighborhoods, that sort of neighborly, uh, hello, good morning, how are you? That sort of doesn't exist in the way it used to. Um, people are scared, people don't wanna to talk to strangers, whatever the case may be. But we were insistent that we were gonna go out there and, and try to encourage people in the midst of all of this mess. Uh, we had a community support line that came online 24 hours, uh, people could call in, they would get connected immediately to a social worker, a therapist, or a case manager. Um, families needed food, families needed um, support, whatever it was, we were there to help support them and then connect with our nonprofit partners in the neighborhood as well. Um, we actually did one summer in Chicago, which is a summer youth employment program. We had over 200 young people employed virtually, first time ever that we've done that. Um, so for staff, um, you know, managing what this in-person staffing was going to look like, right? There were very specific guidelines. You can only have 10 people together in a space. Um, you had to maintain social distancing. We had to implement emergency protocols for, you know, if there was something that happened in the city, what would we be doing? How does our team know what to do? Um, we launch what's called alert media for our team. And so everyone's on cell phone numbers plugged into the system. And so we would regularly communicate any emergency alerts through that. And so now, in addition to just people being on heightened awareness because of all the things that were going on, now the place of employment, Build, is putting you on an extra alert announcement as well. So when you think about that's just the level of stress and anxiety, right? Am I gonna get, what is this alert media telling me to do, right? Am I allowed to come in tomorrow? Are we shutting down? Um, you know, what do I need to know? 
just one more thing that gets added on uh, to what's already a very difficult time. Um, so this was summer camp. This is an aerial view. We um, had these, those are actually tents. They look more like little buildings. Um, they're about 900 square feet. Um, we had 10 people in each of those tents. And this was a very expensive uh, endeavor to run summer camp this way. But um, we were determined to make sure that these young people who were already just, it was shitty. Sorry, it really was. It was just a really horrible time. And we were absolutely committed to making sure these young people were gonna have that this summer, that a moment in their summer that was marred by all of the horrible things that were happening around them, that we were gonna provide them the best summer that we could provide for the seven hours a day that they were with us, for the five days a week that we were they were in our care. We were gonna make this as if they were in this super cool, sort of campus bubble where they could feel like a kid, they could laugh. And I remember um, this, just the infrastructure alone to do summer camp is a quarter of a million dollars. And I remember a few people were like asking me, well, is that the best use of money? And I was like, I, I would pay a million dollars to do this for these young people. When you see the horror, the lack of hope, the fragility of young people, and you, this is our future. When you see that they are marred by the trauma, guess what? I would spend $5 million to put this up so that they could spend six weeks in summer camp with us. And, you know, I, I get aggravated by that because it's clear that you can look at it in terms of money. Was that an expensive summer camp? A hundred percent it was, but these are not normal times. Right under normal circumstances, non-COVID, um, non all of the other things that are happening, our summer camp would not cost what it did. But when you think about, can we provide a space for young people to be and smile, right? To not be traumatized by every single thing that's happening, then guess what? That's what our role is. We are going to do that. As a 50 plus year old organization, it's our responsibility and duty to make sure that these young people smiled and laughed. And I remember pulling up one morning, feeling a little defeated. Again, the morning news of who was shot and killed <clears throat> and learning that, you know, uh, we had lost young people over the weekend. And I see the little kids with their little mask. Of course, you know, it's always like, pull your mask up over your nose, but laughing and smiling and hearing the sounds of what summer should be, it made it all worth it, right? And this is what we have to fight for. Like, it's such a dark time. And, and our most vulnerable people, our young, our youth, um, really need to know that there is light beyond all of this mess. And so I was sort of re-energized by those, by the laughter, by the smiles. And I thought, you know what, we're going to keep moving forward. We're, we're going to keep doing what we need to do to keep kids safe, staff safe. This is, this has to happen in the midst of everything else going on, right? So we have our intervention teams out there. So working uh, on the streets, trying to keep people safe, our clinical teams, um, let me just tell you that the number of Zoom and virtual calls that they were taking uh, was off the charts from young people, their families, trying to stabilize young people. Um, I can't tell you the number of um, young people who were uh, referred for hospitalization, right, who were just suicidal, helpless, hopeless, what can I do? Um, but we were that lifeline for them. This next slide um, is just pieces of what we did. Um, our young people had yoga. So we sit on one full city block, Bill does. So we've got a lot of outdoor space, which makes it nice. Um, there was jump rope. Uh, these kids in the bottom left are in the peace uh, garden and there's a fire pit there. So we use that. And the bottom right uh, are chickens. Of all the things that happened <laughs> during this time, we got chickens. Um, and the cool part about it was that uh, we were supposed to have this whole STEM activity in the spring where we would hatch them from eggs and guess what didn't happen. Uh, but instead we got chickens who were laying eggs who were out there and those kids loved 
you know, check, hanging out with the chickens, talking to them, telling them stories. Again, I, I will say it was just kind of everything that you would want kids to experience during this absolutely insane time. Um, our street teams who were going out um, and uh, on the bottom right is our uh, Black Power Brown Pride mural that uh, the uh, our team member on the left actually painted. Um, I don't know if you remembered, but during the time when communities were, were being looted, uh, I know Little Village really the the gang members there pulled together and worked with the police to basically not have anyone come into the neighborhood. And it really created this divide between black and brown. And our intervention team is black and brown entirely. And so uh, they were inspired not only to make sure that they tell their brothers and sisters, guys, we're in this together. This is not a black issue, it's not a brown issue. We should not be fighting, we should be in unity. Um, and so much so that they wanted to create sort of a, a video and share that widely. And you can see that on, on our webpage as well. So um, one of the words I hope we retire after this year, this new normal, right? Um, I, I look at it as just a way that we've been adapting and learning. And it's like, how do you ever adjust to an ever-changing situation where the new normal is honestly, it's indefinite uncertainty, right? The way that it looks now, you know, the, the rates of COVID infection, right, are at, at us, are skyrocketing. You know, so that probably means we're going to roll back, I assume. Who knows, right? But think about how are you leading young people? How are you helping staff get through all of this, right? Um, this being on all the time, right? I'll, I'll tell you, virtual life is exhausting. And I'm sure many would agree, you know. Um, I think the piece that I was excited about, I was like, great, I never have to drive downtown and pay $40 to park for a one-hour meeting. Uh, well, great. Now I can do everything on Zoom and I can have multiple meetings and, and, and have that be the way. E-learning, uh, helping our young kids uh, who were e-learning in the spring, we're helping them now. Um, and then our own staff members, right, who have kids who are, who are e-learning, just made everything so much difficult. Being home all day, the emotional strain. And again, I'm going to say it's like this constant crisis management day after day after day. So we've been adapting and learning and uh, trying to do our best. And by us adapting and learning means we're helping to teach our young people how they are learning to adapt through this time as well. Um, in this, before we kicked off for the fall as we wrapped up the summer, uh, we did some work with Dr. Darlene Perry, who's a clinical psychologist. And um, we had her do some work with us around you know, uh, wellness, right? And think about what it means in the context of today's world. And, you know, what is an organization's responsibility? And then what is your own personal responsibility to keep yourself well during these times? Um, you know, we learned about the occupational hazards of our work, right? So we provide services uh, to families and youth in greatest need. Um, and oftentimes we're interacting with uh, families, young people who are in a state of crisis, or they're coming from homes that are just struggling with so many complicated issues. And then we learned about, great, these are all the occup occupational hazards of your job, which I will say many of us knew, but I think in the midst of everything, it just really kind of brought it front and center. Compassion fatigue, right? Burnout, anxiety, grief and loss. People had loved ones that were dying to COVID. People had loved ones that were dying to gun violence, right? Excessive drinking, I'm telling you, that happy hour got started earlier and earlier and earlier, right? Substance abuse, depression, and people just barely making it, right? So when you think about us as a workforce, you know, we're charged and with some of the most incredible, greatest work and responsibility to help young people, to help their families. And we do it. We came here by mission, right? As social workers, right? This is who we are. We claim it. We hold on to it. We're proud of it. This is why we do what we do. Um, and under normal circumstances, it's tough. Add the current state of things, it sometimes almost feels unbearable. So now, as we are prepping for fall and going what we call a build week. So we have training that goes the entire week in preparation for our fall programming launch, which is both virtual and in person. 
um, and kind of a resetting of everyone, um, you know, then you're listening to, wow, your job sucks <laughs> in many ways. Um, but here are things that you can do. Nonprofit organization, leadership, you need to provide these spaces for your staff. What are you doing, right? Then, hey, you, as an employee need to take time for yourself. What are you doing, right? And these are your responsibilities to figure out. So it was a lot. Again, I'm gonna add, it's this kind of adapting and learning. Um, a colleague of mine shared an article called Your Search Capacity is Depleted. It's Why You Feel Awful. And the author is Tara Haley. Um, and I thought, why are you sending this out? Like. Can you not tell we're all <laughs> having a tough time at times? Uh, but I was like, great, I'll read it. And I thought it was interesting, right? So you think about what surge capacity is, it's defined in this article as a collection of adaptive systems, mental and physical, that humans draw on for short-term survival in acutely stressful situations such as natural disasters. I was like, of course, that absolutely makes sense, right? Um, when you think about those who've been in floods or hurricanes, tornadoes, right? It's kind of all this that you have to get through it. Sadly though, um, nothing's working right now as it normally was. We can't kiss, hug, love, visit our loved ones, right? For fear of getting them sick. There've been radical shifts in work and school and home life, all that has changed. Um, and just this uncertainty and the chronic stress, you get exhausted, you feel up, you feel down, you feel depleted, and you have these periods of burnout, right? And just mentioned before, sort of the occupational hazards of our work. Um, we have to deal with ambiguous loss, loss that's unclear, right? Like our normal routines. I used to be able to go to the store and just walk right in. I didn't have to wait in a line, right? I didn't have to wear a mask. So I thought about this as, wow, this is powerful, right? And thinking about moving forward and really pushing this team and how we're thinking about our young people. And it just was kind of, what it brought to me was, this is what our young people feel, but on a regular basis, right? And the homes and, and, and that they come from the neighborhoods that they're struggling for survival. And then add all of this on top. It's crushing, it's crushing. So what are we doing? What do we need to do, right? We need to build a resilience fund. What does that mean? Um, you know, as an organization, we have to support remote work. Um, well, of course, Adam, everyone's sheltered in place when we were and we were remotely working, true. Um, but really support it. We have people who don't want to come back, who are fearful, right? I can't be mad at them. Cannot say, come on, you're using it as an excuse. No, we're going to support you. I need people, and what we've offered up is like blackout hours. You are now school session. You are e-learning with your seven-year-old from nine to 10. You then have to take a break and get your 14-year-old to make sure he's in class, right? Like all these things, we're going to make sure you have blackout hours in your day to manage your home life so that you can be successful and provide the work that you need to for build. What are the expectations of full-time work? We had to change all of that, right? We are not expecting you to work your 40 hours to the T. No, you know what? Let's talk about what's happening at home, what you're doing, let's look at your workload. These are the expectations we have of you and we're gonna work with you. We're gonna provide virtual support circles for teams to come and process through just, how are people doing today? Um, we have an employee assistance program and you know, say what you will about an EAP program. You know, there's, there's not always the best sort of uh, perspective on it, but I will tell you that we've had such an uptick in the use of our uh, EAP program. Uh, we brought, we've brought them out on Zoom. We've made sure they let people know exactly what they're entitled to. It's something that we're providing for our team. Uh, we la we've launched a wellness challenge. We want people to really be intentional about their, their wellness. Um, and actually this week we're launching our organizational wellness committee. How do people who've signed up from the team say, I wanna help make sure that Bill is taking care of all of its team members and that they are making sure that we are 
um, healthy as individuals and that the organization stays healthy because if we're not, we can't help the most vulnerable, right? We need to do all these things to make sure that we are able to do our best and be our best. And lastly, give grace to all, right? Many of us are probably on edge a little bit more, a little more cranky, um, and we expect certain things. Like we may have seen people who are like, holy cow, really? I thought you were a rock. I thought you were strong, right? Give grace to all and make no assumptions. And lastly, I, this is when I kind of conclude with, um, you know, all these things are so critical. What I realize in this is that I, as the leader of this organization, have to ensure that this team is taken care of and that they're given what they need to be strong and to be resilient. And um, at the same time, what I'm charged with is to lead and move forward, right? And, it, and it's, it's not an easy thing to do when all you see is blackness around you. And what I've learned is that you have to hold on to every glimmer of light. Any positive thing that happens suddenly gets magnified as, oh my gosh, this miracle from God, let's hold on to it. And in many ways it is. It's critical to hold on to those things and then to share them back because our team needs to know that there is light at the end, that there is there are great things that are happening in the midst of all this ugly because they need to then take that and give that back to young people. So celebrating small victories. I need to count on all the others walking alongside me, right? This is not just Adam makes decisions and, and woo woo. No, I need the team. I need us all to think through this. None of us have been here. There's no playbook as I mentioned earlier. And so how do we do this together? And I also realized I don't have to know it all. Thank God, I don't know it all. I, I don't, and none of us do. And therefore, by the collective thinking and wisdom of us all, we're going to plot a path forward. Lead with humility. Humility, 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 right? Um, is so critical to moving through periods like this. So as I mentioned, when I think about, you know, what leadership right now means and, and things that I've learned is that, um, I'm gonna do everything in my power to ensure that we have the resources to support our staff. I know that that means we can put institute policies, procedures, infrastructure that's going to help keep this team strong. My responsibility is to ensure that it happens. And when we do that, and when I ensure that our staff are strong, that means that the youth that we serve learn resilience because they're seeing that in their mentors, right? That youth feel cared for and supported because their case manager is truly focused on their well being and is not distracted or struggling with their own issues that they may have or their own life circumstances. That youth know who to turn to when they feel like they are spinning out of control. They can pick up the phone, they can call their therapist, and that therapist can be in the moment, not distracted by everything else that's going on, but really be in that moment, right? Because it's now. And it's, it's life or death. And so these young people know that this therapist is emotionally available and ready to listen and take on and process and work them through that. And lastly, that youth will always know that Bill will be there for them when they can't count on and that they can count on us to be that rock, that light in the darkness. And at the end of the day, we are the purveyors of hope that we instill within each and every young person we touch. And that's what I've learned. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Wow. Um, I've always been inspired by hearing about your work and this is uh, no exception to that. And um, we wanna thank you for coming and thank sharing you. this time. Um, and really being um, really honest about the challenges as well as um, you know, how much work you've, you've been able to do in this past year under duress. Um, it's certainly a model uh, of care and, uh, within community, honoring community. 
um, the images of the children. It's it's amazing. Um, think about thinking about um, how meaningful uh, the space uh, that you provide, that build provides. Um, it's really remarkable. So thank you so much for thank you for sharing you. and coming this morning. Um, it's about nine thirty, so we want to. Um, give folks time to transition into their tracks and their sessions. Um, we welcome you all. Thank you for coming. We're excited. Um, and Adam, we appreciate you starting off the day. Um, and that was a, a true keynote for the day. Um, so we'll, we'll end there. And I'm happy we, we have this recorded. Um, a really amazing information there. Uh, so for those of you who are on the call, you can go ahead and look at your track numbers and see which sessions you'll be on. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of you.